Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today, we're finally going to be talking about the newest album from Earl Sweatshirt called Some Rap Songs. So I've always struggled a little bit with how to properly evaluate Earl Sweatshirt, or indeed, how much I can even call myself a fan. Don't get me wrong, I have scored both his albums thus far pretty highly. I think he's a great rapper with a powerful knack of distilling complex ideas down to aggressively concise points, and he's got a knack for honest introspection that rarely gets the credit it deserves, especially given his origin point within Odd Future. But I'd also struggle to say that I've revisited a lot of his work outside of a few songs, and his very limited presence in the hip-hop world at large has always given me the odd feeling I could be hearing so much more from him, and yet I really don't. And thus it was with a little trepidation that I was approaching some rap songs, his first album in over three years and his shortest to date. Clocking in under a half hour, it nevertheless has already gotten a reputation for being a pretty dense and experimental listen at length. And... Honestly, I wasn't sure how to take that, as wild experimentation in tone and production hasn't really been a thing for Earl Sweatshirt. He's favored dusty, stripped back, usually very dark production, so I didn't really have a gauge on where he would take this. I did know he, that he had lost his father and a close family friend who he considered his uncle earlier this year, and Earl Sweatshirt has always had a complicated relationship with his family, so I expected that subtext to loom over this pretty heavily, so alright, what did we get with some rap songs? Well, it's difficult to really talk about this project, as once again, we're dealing with the sort of album that is more designed to craft a mood and complicated emotion with its sound and structure rather than put forward a coherent point. And more than ever, it actually resists straightforward analysis. Oh, there are some themes and ideas and fragments of really good wordplay here, but Earl Sweatshirt is aiming more to capture a sense of diffuse, muddled emotion, a blend of depression and angst that doesn't flow forth easily in a way that can be easily structured or contextualized. And yet, while the flurry of lo-fi fragments might imply some level of abstraction, we're still dealing with Earl Sweatshirt here, a rapper who will strip out unnecessary language for bluntness in order to make his hard point, except when language fails him. And he can't. And yet I find myself wishing that I could connect with this more strongly than I do. A project of muddy intimacy that doesn't want to be touched and then deflects the audience whenever they attempt to try to. So in other words, I don't quite love it as much as I want. And it's kind of hard to pinpoint where the wires just aren't connecting for me. Because outside of the production, which we will discuss at length, Earl Sweatshirt is delivering pretty much exactly what you would expect from him. His flow is a little bit more halting and scattered. His rhymes don't quite connect as consistently, which I'll it gets a little distracting for me, even if I will be a bit more forgiving with it here, given the themes. But for someone in the throes of anxiety, extreme introversion, depression, and grappling with a pileup of emotions that comes from losing multiple father figures, it's not surprising he's rapping like this. And thus, it kind of makes sense that there's an attempted projection of strength on some songs, even as he struggles and often fails to assemble the words and wonders why nobody has told him his grief and pain was so evident to everyone else around him. And all this is amidst the larger strains that he's touched on before. The fame that came way too early and expectations under which even you can tell Earl will be straining even if things were going well. Nowhere to go and December 24th make that very apparent because for as much as he was elevated for his introspection and his darker content given a lot of real fame and success, it didn't lessen the weight or help repair bridges to a distant father figure with whom he had never properly reconciled or was never even really understood even by his larger family. But then you get a larger concern consideration of the aspect of time itself, both wasted or lost altogether. Earl Sweatshirt knows that his silence has power, and while he's been attempting to use the previous couple years in order to process his life, he's also very keenly aware that amidst the drudgery and loneliness, time and potential bars and songs have ticked away, and yet he's persevered. It's very telling that The Bends is a moment of reflection on success he's had in the face of the tragedy strewn across the album, but also a reference to one of Radiohead's most pronounced albums for wallowing in melancholy. Also their best album, but that's a different review. And yet, he doesn't hold back words for those who have now tried to approach him in the meantime. Their words have died in their throats as seasons have changed and time has passed. And while time has made him grow stronger, it's also made him grow colder. The wallow has ended. He's found a few scattered friends along the way. And while 
Oz's mother may have seen his father in him before. Now that lonely ghost is very much in the past, and what that means is still up for interpretation. But all the while, he's aware of the twisted contradiction that snaps into place on songs like Eclipse, where the parallel to albums like Skeleton Tree by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds or A Crow Looked at Me by Mount Erie naturally comes into view. The paradox of making art out of layers of such grief and pain and depression. For the sake of his mental state and his own protection, he wants to close off some of those doors and that vulnerability in his life, but that's what he's made his success out of, and he misses the luster that came with some of its popular acclaim, even despite him hating that. But time itself adds another dimension. It muddies the emotions and memories going further. It further denies him that clarity, and yet it's not like he's changed all that much either. Even the time away and his radio silence in the face of real trauma, even if that might have given people that impression. And he's still as self-aware as ever. As he says on Veins, he's sitting on a star, he's found some success, but he's not a star. So is there even a point to saying all of this? It's not going to give him any more stardom, or is it at least therapeutic for him? Honestly, the more lessons I give some rap songs, the more I get the impression that this project fills that therapeutic role most of all. Not for us at all as an audience, but more for him. Trying his damnedest to dismiss our voyeurism, but you know what? Maybe just wanting enough applause to give us a glimpse all the same. Just let us into his world, just, just to crack. And if that wasn't significant evidence that Earl Sweatshirt is paradoxically shoving us both in and out the door with some rap songs, the production sure as hell gets there. Initially, I was kind of thrown off by the lo-fi, sample-heavy tones being a little bit brighter than the trudging melancholy of I don't like ship, I don't go outside, but there were traces of this direction on that album, only this time Earl's choice of sampling and song fidelity is intentionally much more muddy and scattered, with 15 songs barely clearing 24 minutes and most not even reaching the two-minute mark. And it kind of makes sense that there's brighter moments, because sometimes in the face of that depression, and grief, you do laugh, even if you don't want to. And with all of that, comes the question of, if you don't like the soul or jazz sample fragment cushioned by a thickened bass, it really determines if you're going to like these fragments that you get. So while I might like the bubbly soul chop of Shattered Dreams or the blurry keys of Cold Summers and December 24th, then you get a song like the moaning gray oscillation of Red Water, where Earl actually sampled his own work, or you get the messy pileup of watery funk on Lucy, they just don't click for me whatsoever. Not bad songs, but not great either. And what's strange is that the level of distortion or fidelity doesn't even really impact how much it might work for me, especially with the understanding that getting a hook on any of these songs is a total crapshoot. The stuttered Radiohead-esque sampling as the faint guitars on Nowhere to Go, it managed to work as well as the warm scratchy soul of On the Way, or the glittery flutter of Azucar, or the rickety pianos of the Mint. But you know what, there's two very notable moments of sampling that should really be highlighted as the centerpiece of the album. The first coming on Playing Possum, the entire song comprised of interweaving samples of a benediction from his mother and a fragment of poetry from his late father. Poetry that earlier on the album, Earl Sweatshirt crowed would get him a cease and desist letter from that father figure. A cease and desist that would never come, as his father died before he ever heard the song. And when it intermingled with his mother's voice and how she had once seen his father in him, it shows the emotions ever so more tangled. But then comes the final two songs, a tribute to that family friend and uncle with the thickest lo-fi shutter on Peanut to date, alleviated with a final instrumental sample for him for Riot. Quaking and cut off before it reaches a moment of true triumph, but maybe a glimmer of hope nonetheless. And as a whole, look guys, I really want to love this album. I really do. It's weird, it's tangled and experimental, but the sort of album that just really nails the mess of emotions that comes with losing loved ones and thus winds up feeling all the more human and intimate. And while I can't imagine Earl Sweatshirt will continue in this lane, this really feels like a one-time thing, I respect his courage to make something that is so challenging. And yet it's a project that I can respect so much more than I really like it. The emotional resonance feels muted by its layers of execution and tangled the approach to abstraction and theme. And like with A Crow Looked At Me, it's got the brand of rawness in its content that might feel too intimate, and yet when it's deflected it leaves me in a kind of weird place, just like that album did. But I can't score this one, so as such I'm giving it a strong 7 out of 10 and a recommendation, but a qualified one. It's absolutely not for everyone. Not even all Earl Sweatshirt fans will embrace this. It's lo-fi, it's experimental, it's tangled and fractured in the way that these sort of emotions often are, but you know what? I can see if you can get invested in the sound and the content, this will really resonate for you. So yeah, definitely take the time, check this out. It's powerful stuff, all the same. 
So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Let's try to keep this review shorter than half the album. So if you want to actually buy or stream the album, links down there below. And all the fans who absolutely adore this, polls right there, you all can tell me how wrong I am. Looking forward to it. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process before the end of this year or help support the channel, link to my Patreon right over there, where three times a week you guys get to vote on my schedule, and once a week for the higher tier contributors, you guys get to add albums, movies, or even top 10 lists to that schedule. More details right over there. If you want to see my schedule, it's on my Instagram, link down there below. But till then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.